insignificant little blue-green planet whose eight descended life forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think rebooting sci-fi franchises is a pretty neat <laughs> idea. This planet has, or rather had, a problem, which was this. Most of the people on it were unhappy for pretty much all of the time. Many solutions were suggested for this problem, but most of these were largely concerned with the movements of small green pieces of paper, which not because on the whole it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. <laughs> and so the problem remained. Lots of the people were mean, and most of them were miserable. This is the story of a book, or rather, a book about a book. The latter book being The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Not an Earth book, never published on Earth, <coughs> and until the terrible catastrophe occurred, never seen or heard of by any Earthman. Nevertheless, a wholly remarkable book, probably the most remarkable book ever to come out of the great publishing houses of Ursa Minor, of which no Earthman had ever heard either. More popular than the celestial home care omnibus, better selling than 50 more things to do in zero gravity, and more controversial than Ul and Kalufid's trilogy of philosophical blockbusters, Where God Went Wrong, some more of God's greatest mistakes, and who is this God person anyway? The former book is called The Fru. It is the all-new, officially authorized history of the creator of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the late and lamented brain box Douglas Adams. I am Slarty, I'm sorry, no, I am Toby Longworth. <laughs> the current brain Slarty Bartlass, and wow Wowbagger, the infinitely prolonged in Dirk Mack's Hitchhiker's Guide radio show. Whereas this is the Fruits author, comedy historian Jim Roberts. And of course, some peanuts. Yes, so I said beer is a relaxant for any human beings uh, travelling through hyperspace, and uh, the nuts are good for replacing salt and protein lost in the process. No, I just thought you'd fancy some pints and some nuts, but it's fine. It's called interspecies sex. So far, there has been very little description in this narrative of the relationship between Zaphod Beeblebrox and Trillium, and there is a reason for this. They are, strictly speaking, of different species. Anyone who needs any further explanation should consult the Imperial Galactic Law Statute 161251-110352, stroke which covers what it calls unnatural practices. <clears throat> the statute is, frankly, repressive, and falls into three separate sections. The first is astonishingly long and graphic and describes exactly what the statute means by unnatural practices. <laughs> the second section is, by contrast, extremely brief and defines exactly how much of this sort of thing anyone else is allowed to describe in a published work. <laughs> the third section deals with penalties for contravening section two and is, if anything, even longer and more graphic than section <laughs> one. <laughs> This is a relatively recent statute. Astonishingly enough, until you think it through, it was actually conceived and made into law during the presidency of Zaphod Beeblebrox himself. <laughs> the reason why this is on the face of it astonishing is that in all other respects, Zaphod's presidency was the most decadent in history. The reason why it ceases to be astonishing when you think it through is this. Zaphod is widely thought to have written most of section one himself. <laughs> the statute as a whole, A, is pure pornography, B, outlaws all other pornography, <laughs> C, is therefore the only book in the galactic history of publishing to have outsold that wholly remarkable book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> Because of an inexplicable computer malfunction, there is no one who can say for certain where the revenue from the sales of this statute ended up, but equally, there is no one who can't guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of people, when they think of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the first thing they think of is the TV show. The reason I'm standing here in this not terribly Arthur Dent robe is because the TV show set that vision of Arthur Dent in people's minds of, of what he looked like. And um, there was one series, but as uh, many a uh, Hitchhiker fan knows, there was supposed to be two. 
Um, but Douglas was holding out, this is sort of 1981, again, the same time as uh, Life, the Universe and everything. He had this old Doctor Who plot, The Cricket Wars, which he wanted to do, and he kept coming back to Arthur and Ford stuck on prehistoric Earth and having to get them off the planet and finding many different ways. But this is how the second TV series, had it been made, was supposed to happen. Douglas said he wasn't writing, but there were several pages of a script. It began just shortly with uh, Peter Jones, again, talking about the terrible failure rate of planets and civilizations, but they still continue to arise. And then there was a very brief, strange thing with characters called Adman and Eve, who were in this Eden <laughs> on the same planet. Did you see what he's done there? In, exactly, and they met a robotic advertising snake who, uh, who, was, who could advertise, who could sell anything to you from an apple to a dog turd. And uh, there was all this, and there was something to do with consultant. You'd need to read the fruit to understand what, even vaguely, what Douglas was getting at. Yes, you've got some, some of the ideas that he may have had uh, lined oh, up. Oh, yes, yeah. indeed. In fact, also, there was a lot, there were pages and pages of ideas, notes that Douglas took as suggestions of where the second <coughs> television series would go. So, uh, what do you call it? Call it? New and, are you going to read that bit? I'll, I'll start with the first one. This is just a, a list of Douglas's vague ideas Ultimate Truth Drive. I think that this idea is nice if it's very quick. It was originally going to be a great quest, but I think it's worth about ten minutes. Or <laughs> about towels. <laughs> Return of Slarty Barkfast. But in what capacity? Astrology. How does it work if you're travelling all the time? They should meet an astrologer who wanders about. More about hitchhiking. Coleridge. <laughs> <laughs> Flying lessons. Forest toupees. <laughs> Resident who is paid to take the blame for everything. <laughs> the 17 million year pause. <laughs> Man who exists only to fulfill one specific function. His function may be needed twice in one day, and then not for another 20 or indeed 20 million years. All the time in between is in suspended animation. We should see a bit of life from his point of view. <laughs> the submarine refuge. I wonder now how good an idea this is. I, I think I was a bit drunk at the time. <laughs> the monks will believe anything for a day. <laughs> the man who is always busy. He's gone for lunch. He's gone to Venezuela. He's died. When's he due back? I have to find out from the reincarnation registry. <laughs> the underwater crashed ship. The sole surviving crewman who thinks he has been found and rescued when in fact he's only been found. <laughs> other points get rid of Zaphod's other head build up Trillium <laughs> ok so here we are now so that's a vague idea of where it would have gone anyway we cut from Adman and Eve on this prehistoric planet we are now going to try and piece together well, one thing I would say you know, to make you feel better about this this I am pretty certain will be the absolute geeky epicentre of this comedy book festival yeah. we don't find anything happening more geeky than this we are going to try and reconstruct how the second series of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy yeah. would have started. We're going we're through the Geekiverse. Yes, I shall be sent to be Arthur, and Toby shall be Ford. And an abrupt cut to Arthur and Ford. They're sitting disconsolately in a field. They are fairly dishevelled, but they have obviously been making an attempt to shave since last we saw them, so their chins are stubbly rather than overgrown. Okay, the day should be heavy or cloudy or cold or unpleasant in some way, but not raining. I'm really getting to hate rain. <laughs> Ford Prefect is carving a notch in a stick, which already has several notches in it. We will deduce that he is simply notching off the days they have been on prehistoric Earth. As our field of view widens or the camera changes angle, we will see a long line of sticks stretching out of sight. Arthur has spread a towel out on the ground as a trap. He's just putting a heavy stone on each of its corners. He is doing it with the air of a shrewd and experienced trapper. The air is not convincing. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible day. I shall be glad to see the end of this. Yeah, also a badly carved day. <laughs> I think I may at last be beginning to lose interest in gouging bits of wood out of bits of wood. Look at it. This is the point at which we see the endless wooden calendar stretching off into the distance. Arthur looks at it. He shrugs. Less impressive than Stonehenge, but it keeps track of time. Time! Ha! Ford Prefect! Small, mobile, intelligent unit, hoopiest hitcher in the galaxy, fastest recorded time from Beetlejuice to Altair and scored twice on the way. <laughs> Measures out his miles in light years, and now what? 
Here I am on this miserable little planet again, measuring out my weeks in stick yards. I mean, all right, it keeps track of time. It tells me what I've done week by week. I mean, last week I, uh, I carved that stick. The previous week I, I, carved, I carved that stick. Week before that I carved um, that stick. Week before that, an Ithuan sky fishing ship only goes and lands in the next bloody field, but company regulations, they can't take passengers because of the insurance. <laughs> insurance! I carved that stick, I got very angry about it. <laughs> and that won't work. Why not? With hundreds, thousands of square miles of... Uh, lost my place again, this is going terrible here. <laughs> well, hundreds, there we go, hundreds of thousands of square miles of grass and woodland to choose from. Why would any animal in its right mind choose to stand in an old towel with stones round it? Well, bang goes another idea for lunch. Uh, being on this planet of yours in the 20th century was bad enough. At least you could get a hamburger and hear some noise. I swear to hear some noise! At that moment, a totally inexplicable noise starts up. It is the sound of hammering and drilling, the moving around of heavy objects and general building work. Pull back from Arthur and Ford to emphasise the fact that they are in an empty field. They react in astonishment. <gasps> Do that? Where's it coming from? Uh, the only place it can be coming from is the ground. The trouble is that it isn't. Uh, 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 they, they walk, walk about experimentally again, calling out, Hello! Hello? Hello? At one point they both cross the line of four sticks. At that moment, the noise stops abruptly. They pull themselves up short. They look at each other and shrug. <laughs> they relax and walk back. As they cross the line, the noise starts again. Something's going on there. <laughs> Somebody's making something. Or taking something apart. Well, can you see anything? Look, let's go for a walk. You, wear, you walk where you can hear it, and I'll walk where I can. Then we'll know that the dividing line is between us. I am right in thinking this is very odd, aren't I? Oh, yes. <laughs> and that's good, is it? Yes, yes, yes. It rained. The day before, it rained. The day before that, it rained. The day before that, and the day before that, it rained. Today, this happens. This is better. <laughs> <laughs> we pull back into even longer shots and we see that they are walking towards a rectangular black shape. Ah. Ah. You see? Yes. What do I see? How should I know? I've given up on sense data. Now, hang about. Here's a notice. Warning. Well, that's something, I suppose. Yeah, not a lot, but something. There's another notice. We are carrying out routine structural maintenance in the spatio-temporal dimension. <laughs> structural maintenance of a field? A uh, space-time field. Ah, look, there's another. Normal causality will be restored very shortly. Meanwhile, why not enjoy the difference? <laughs> Ford finds another notice. We don't immediately see it, though we should notice that it is in a silver frame and beautifully lettered. Ford is obviously deeply moved by what he reads. Yes! This is what we, the world, the universe, have waited all this time to be told. This is the most important message ever. Awesome! Oh, thank you! Thank you! Oh, it's all right. That's all we wanted to hear. We can manage now. Surely a message like this should be broadcast around the whole universe, not just to us. Well, we'll do it. We'll go out and tell everybody. We, we apologise for the inconvenience! <laughs> we now see, and there shall be a dramatic music to accompany the sight, the side view of the rectangle we saw a few minutes ago. There isn't actually much to see, a side view, as it's pretty narrow, say six inches wide, certainly no more. The shot should look very cinematic and dramatic, with Ford and Arthur on either side of the screen in the foreground, and the thing situated between them, but at a distance in front of them. What do you think it is? I don't can you feel some sort of strange emanation, some sort of strange alien force be beckoning us towards it? No, can you? Well, I sort of think I can. <laughs> What's it like? Well, it's a bit hard to describe. I've never been beckoned to by strange alien forces before. <laughs> Except Zaphon Beeglebrox when he wants someone to get him a drink. Zaphon! We should feel, if Toby, or David, can convey it in one word, that Ford has deliberately not even thought about Zaphod all this time, and that hearing his name disturbs him in all sorts of ways. Well, Zaphod's a strange alien. Well, that depends on what you mean by alien. Depends what you mean by strange. Yes. I know what I mean. Shall we um, go and see this thing? Uh, yes. 
Emanation is not bothering you? I can live with them. Uh, getting stronger, are they? What? The emanations as we uh, get closer. Not particularly. They're staying much at the same level. Will you shut up about the emanations? <laughs> <coughs> they arrive at the thing. Turns out to be a door. Not only is it a door, but it uh, really is just any old door. It's battered, the rather nastily applied paint is thank goodness, beginning to peel off it. Now, it's the sort of door which probably leads to a cellar or storeroom. It's set in its own frame, and it is aligned along the line of sticks, which is why it seemed very thin as we approached it with Paul and Arthur, and why it appeared to be a large solid object when we saw it from the right angled direction, silhouetted against the sun. It's a door! A door! It's an ordinary nasty door! Uh, hello! <laughs> Do that again! What? Open the door! What, like that? Yes! Good God! What? Well, what can you see? You? What can you see? Something totally mind shattering. Well, what? what? Well, there's a staircase. <laughs> Your mind shatters easily. <laughs> <laughs> Would you just come round and knock? <laughs> Ford goes round the doorway looking from Arthur's side. Looking through the open door from Arthur's side, he's forced to abandon his sceptical attitude because what Arthur is looking at is, in fact, rather peculiar. Through the open door is roughly what you might expect to see through such a door if it wasn't stuck on its own in the middle of a field. Through the doorway is a sort of concrete hallway with concrete stairs going up and down, the sort of stairs you would find in a multi-storey car park. To one side of the staircase are a pair of lift doors. They are fairly stained and have some indecipherable alien graffiti on them. It's a service lift. Ford stares at it in what, if he was challenged on the point, he would have to admit was disbelief. He enters the hallway and goes in rather tentatively. Equally tentatively, he goes a little way up the stairs. This is going to be tricky to achieve, isn't it? Still, we're not here to enjoy ourselves. <laughs> Ford, where are you going? When I've been there, ask me where I've come from. <laughs> or you can come too, if you like, and ask me where we are. Are you sure this is wise? Well, do you want to be wise or do you want to be safe? Well, I think it's wise to be safe. Well, wisdom comes by learning from your mistakes, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Well, we'd better make some. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a <laughs>